James and John have they're wonderful examples of active ambition. James and John want what all of us want. They want to be at the top of the heap. They want to have the positions of honour. And they think they know a clever way to get there. You see, as the Gospels tell the story of Jesus, it's pretty clear that there's, there is a group of three disciples who are more often said to be with Jesus than the others. Jesus sometimes even takes them apart from the others. And that group is Peter, James and John. And Peter is always named first in that list. But James and John have considered in the places of honour at the right and the left hand of Jesus, there are only two places. And so they take this opportunity in a moment when Peter is not around to see whether they might get themselves promoted from numbers 2 and 3 to numbers 1 and 2. They don't just want to be in the inner circle, but they also want to be at the top of the inner circle. And I guess because they're brothers, they don't mind which way round goes. And they think then that they can get Jesus to do this by getting him to promise ahead of time to do whatever they want. Lord, we want you to give us whatever we ask. And of course, don't we want him to do that? But the other disciples in the story are just as bad. They're just slower off the mark. I'm sure that part of the indignation that rises up amongst the other disciples is simply from the fact that they didn't think of this first. Despite their expectations. Though, Jesus rebukes all the disciples. They are all in for a surprise. Because he goes on to say that being his disciple is not about the places of honour. Being his disciple is going to lead to of service, to sacrifice, and even to suffering for the sake of other people. And the one who is greatest will be the one who serves everybody else. The disciples in this story come across as grasping, as ambitious as it is possible to be. But we ought to be careful how we judge them because we too are prone to those same ambitions. We naturally seek our own value, we naturally seek our security in the trappings of power and recognition and status. We'd much rather be the people who are being served than be the people who are doing the serving. It's much nicer to wake up and have someone make breakfast for you than it is to be the one who gets up early to make breakfast. And I've got to say, that's kind of how it works. I'm the one who sleeps in in my house. And we often see this dynamic at work in the very simplest thing. It's a daily occurrence, isn't it? Think of the things that you walk past every day and you go, oh, that's just so annoying. I wish someone would do something about that. It happens all the time. We see litter and go, somebody should do something about that. We know that there's a hard conversation that needs to be had with somebody and we think to ourselves, somebody should do something about that. There's a task that clearly needs to be done. Anyone, you think, could see that that needs to be done. Somebody should do something about that. And somehow it never seems to occur to us in those circumstances that we are somebody. We wait for others to do it because serving doesn't make us feel important. We think that we are valuable. 
we think that we are significant when other people are serving us. And that's even more the case when service actually asks something from us. We tend to avoid situations which cost us something. Suffering doesn't just seem like something that winners would do. Sacrifice, which is chosen suffering, therefore seems out of the question. Of course we are devoted disciples of Jesus so long as it doesn't cost us anything. God forbid that choosing his way should make us feel uncomfortable. God forbid that choosing to go his way would mean foregoing some pleasures of life. Now those attitudes are natural enough. They're kind of very human attitudes. But Jesus says to us that as his followers, among you it shall not be so. Followers of Jesus are called into lives of service. Our greatness is not to be found in lording it over other people, but rather in serving them. The person who is greatest in God's sight is the one who is the servant of all. The greatest among Jesus' disciples is more often going to be found in the janitor's closet than they are in the CEO's office. Their hands will be more often in the washing up water than they are in the money. Our desire to lord it over other people is a straight out contradiction of God's will for our lives. In our drive of self exaltation we become so self-centred that we forget our place before God and we take our focus off God and place it on ourselves. As Jesus says elsewhere, there are two great commands, to love the Lord your God with all that you have and to love your neighbour as yourself. And our desire to be served interferes with both of those. In our need to find safety and significance by having others serve us, we are driven apart from acting like disciples of Jesus. We cannot walk the path of Jesus because we're not willing to pay the price of what he commands. When we're focused on being the greatest, when we're focused on finding our security in having others serve us, then our hearts are in fact turned away from God's servants. And to turn our back on other people is to turn our back on God. In our text today, James and John desire to be exalted over everybody else, but the way that they choose to do that is telling because they choose to do that in a way that suggests that they will dictate terms to Jesus. They will tell God himself how things will turn out. We want you to give us anything we ask for. Can you see how that's completely reversed the nature of the relationship? Now they have turned not just other people, but God himself into a servant. As they demand that others serve them, they end up demanding that God does as well. I don't know if you're familiar with the movie Aladdin, but there's a scene in it when the, the genie's giving Aladdin the three wishes, and he says in the, in the Disney movie at least, and Ixnay on wishing for more wishes. <laughs> you can't just use this wish to get more wishes. But that's what James and John are doing. They found a wonderful question. We want you to give whatever we ask. What we ask is that we will be at your right hand and your left and once we're at the right hand and the left hand of God, that means we will be able to get everything else we ever desired. They are in fact coming to Jesus and say, we wish for more wishes. We want you to make it happen. 
<laughs> and God says no. Jesus holds out to us a completely different way of life. Those who are the greatest among us are not those that everybody serves. Those who are the greatest among us are the ones who make themselves the servants of all. But as Jesus gives us this new way of life, he also makes this new way of life possible. Jesus asked James and John, can you drink the cup? Can you have the baptism? And in both cases, those are imageries of suffering. But listen to how he names them. He asks whether they can take the cup and the baptism of suffering and he calls them, can you drink the cup that I drink? Can you be baptised with the baptism with which I am baptised? The question is less is about their suffering, but it's around whether they can do what Jesus himself is doing. And when he talks about service, that the greatest will be the one who is the servant of all, he concludes there, for even the Son of Man, that's Jesus himself, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus asks nothing of us that he has not already done for us. The way that Jesus, the one who is himself God, lives out his greatness is true service and obedience. In Philippians chapter 2, in the Christ hymn there, we are reminded that though he was in very nature God, yet he was born of, as one of us, he took on the form of a servant, he humbled himself and he became obedient, obedient even unto death. And the Nicene Creed, which we sometimes use here in church, uh, is the creed where it says that Jesus is God from God, light from light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father by whom all things were made. And then it goes on to tell the whole story of Jesus' life and death and resurrection and ascension and he's now ruling for us. But he tells that whole story, introducing it with these words, for us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. This one who is very God of very God, the one who is the creator of the universe, for us came down from heaven. And that means that even though we have failed to serve God, God has served us. Even though we have refused God's will, God has willed to save us. Even though we have exalted ourselves over God and broken relationship with him, God has humbled himself in order to forgive us and to restore that relationship. We can therefore be entirely safe, secure and significant in the love of God. What need do we have for other people to serve us when we have already been served by God himself? Our future is secure. We do not need to fight and to strive and to put others down to know that we will be loved, to know that we will be okay. Because God has given us everything for which we would fight. Our status is in no way dependent on our capacity to end up at the top of the heap. By grace, Jesus exalts us and raises us up to be with him. Indeed, even the scriptures say to rule with him. God himself has honoured you. God himself has knelt to serve you. 
And as we come to him in our worship, as we hear his teaching, we receive his word of absolution, and we take Christ himself in the sacrament of the altar, he is still serving us. He is still pouring out his love. He is still telling us that we are precious enough for him to die for. This is his body and blood which is given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. What greater status could there be than the status which is contained in those words given and shed for you? When we grasp the enormity of that, as we grasp how God continues to serve us, surely that changes how we act. We no longer need to be served by other people to feel good about ourselves. Now we feel good about ourselves so that we are able to serve other people. This is what enables us to serve and to sacrifice in love for others and for the cause of Jesus. Back in church history, St. John Chrysostom was suffering under the Empress Eudoxia and he writes to his friend telling him how he was thinking about this interview with the Empress coming up. And he says, I thought, will she banish me? The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Will she take away my goods? Naked I came from my mother's womb and uh, naked I will return. Will she stone me? I remembered Stephen. Will she behead me? John the Baptist came to mind. No matter what the cost of his service, Chrysostom knew that he was more than adequately served by God. There was nothing that she could take away that God could not give. There was no penalty she could give that was not outweighed by the glory that God would give him. And still today around the world, there are many examples of missionaries who serve others and pay the cost of doing so because they know that Christ has served them. That frees them to serve Christ in return and thereby to serve other people. There's a former member of our own congregation who is serving overseas in a place where the staple food is food that she's allergic to, where her housing is kind of always up in the air, where people she grows attached to and builds a relationship with are moving on. And she continues to be there and to serve because she knows that God has served her. She knows how rich she is in Christ and is therefore able to be poor for the sake of others. And it doesn't just happen in foreign lands. We see this. If you look, you will see it here in our midst as well. People give generously. People give extravagantly with their time and their effort. There are people amongst us who are giving up their comfort, who are giving up their pleasures for the sake of other people. We now serve joyfully because our status is secure in Christ. Even suffering now takes on a new meaning. When we suffer or sacrifice for the sake of service, we are participating in Christ's own work in the world. And we know that that is the greatest thing that we can do. To those who are gripped by selfish ambition, to those who are always struggling to assert their own identity and their own importance. There is no possibility of choosing to suffer, to sacrifice or serve for the other people. Those things would simply be a sign of your defeat and your weakness. But to those who find their greatness already given to them in Christ, suffering and service are not the signs of defeat. They are the signs of true greatness. Every time you choose to serve another person, you are celebrating what Christ has done for you. Every time you sacrifice 
for the sake of God's purposes, you are actually enjoying the identity and the reward that God has already given you. You're simply taking from the riches you have and giving them out to others. We can therefore have a new ambition. In following Jesus, we ourselves have already been served and therefore our ambition now is to follow him by serving. We don't try to get in first to be the ones that others look up to, to be the ones that others serve. Instead now we are free to be the first to serve the needs of others. Some look around and as they see the needs of people around them, all they see is a constant, never-ending drain on their resources. All they see is the invitation to step into unimportance. We look around and we see the needs of others as the opportunities for us to demonstrate our security and our significance in Christ. That changes everything. To those who do not know the love of God, the world serves the great. But to those who know that they are in Christ, the great are the one who serve. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.